treasures of the house of the Lord. Many people in the world today are unaware of the splendor and wealth of ancient Israel. The purpose of this article is to describe briefly the wealth of ancient Israel associated with the mystery of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temples built in Jerusalem. The materials assembled for the tabernacle are described in detail in Exodus 35 through 38 and summarized in Exodus 38, 21 through 30. The tabernacle of Moses would be worth over 30 million today. The golden lampstand in the tabernacle weighed a talent and would today be worth a half million dollars for its gold alone. The Tabernacle The Tabernacle, also known as the Sanctuary or Tent of Meeting. The Tabernacle, only priest, out of courtyard, people allowed. Inside the Tabernacle, the most holy place or holy of holies, only the high priest. The holy place, only priest. The tabernacle would be worth over 13 million today. The lampstead weighed a talent. Holy place of the tabernacle, the golden lampstead. Beaten out of one piece of pure gold. Each branch fed by reservoir of oil in the base. Worth half of a million in gold. King David, Bristol Psalter, 11th century. The History of Ancient Israel by Michael Grant. Defeat of the army of the Philistines by David. They lost both their maritime and land traffic to David and their trading town of Tel El Castle became a commercial center of the Israelites instead. Syrians settled and 
established a number of quite powerful independent kingdoms. Aram Zoba, rich in copper, was one of them. Now David decisively defeated its monarch, Ben Haddad I, Haddad Ezer, seizing his copper supplies and other lucrative plunder and bringing the entire territory under his own control. He also reduced to client's status, short of actual annexation, a second Aramean kingdom, Hamath, besides the Orientes, which had access to Syrian elephants and conducted a profitable ivory trade. Tyre, its ruler, Hiram I, the Great, 970 B.C. to 936 B.C., conqueror, builder, and suppressor of rebellions, was delighted by David's subjugation of the Philistines, which had helped his maritime commerce by enabling him to utilize the port of Joppa, Jaffa, for the disembarkation of the wood he exported. And he also wanted access to the inland trade routes, which were now under David's control. For the first and only time in history, Israel had become a major political power, a complex Near Eastern empire. Ark of testimony, menorah, altar of incense, table of showbread, copper basin, copper altar. It is known that most of all of the holy vessels of gold and silver from the tabernacle were with the ark when it was brought from the city of David to the first temple by Solomon, 1 Kings 8 and 4. These materials included 100,000 talents of gold and 1 million talents of silver. First Chronicles 29. From his own private fortune, David also gave 3,000 talents of gold and 7,000 talents of high grade silver. This is an enormous quantity of gold and silver by any standard. 100,000 talents of gold equals 3,000. 750 tons value today equals 45 billion dollars 1 million talents of silver equals 37,500 tons value today 10.8 billion in round numbers the wealth of the first temple was about 56 billion dollars The first temple worth about $56 billion. 
dollars. Solomon's Temple. the richest people in history up until the Industrial Revolution. King Solomon, a 16th century icon. How did he get so rich? Number one, every year for his 39 years of rule, it is said that Solomon received 25 tons of gold as tribute. This alone works out to more than 40 billion. Number two, most of Solomon's riches came from business, trade, and tribute from Arabia and Levant. Number three, his throne is said to have been made with pure gold coating and ivory inlays, along with 12 lion statues and even a footstool made of solid gold. Number four, King Solomon was so rich that it is said that his immense wealth caused silver to become worthless as rocks. King Solomon, 970 to 931 BCE, Israel. His worth, 2.2 trillion. Occupation, king. According to the Bible, King Solomon was famous for his wealth and wisdom, even in far away lands. The works of Josephus, complete and unabridged, new updated edition. Translated by William Winston. Antiquities of the Jews, Book 8, Chapter 7. But King Solomon, moreover, the king built many ships in the Egyptian Bay of the Red Sea and a certain place called Ezon Geber. This country belonged formerly to the Jews and became useful for shipping. A sufficient number of men theater for pilots and such as were skilled in navigation, to whom Solomon gave this command that they should go along with his own stewards to the land Aria Tresonosis, which belongs to India, to fetch him gold. And when they have gathered 400 talents together, they return to the king again. Golden Chersonese. The Golden Chersonese, or Golden Chersonese, Latin, Chersonesis, Aurea, the Golden Peninsula, was the name used for the Malay Peninsula by Greeks and Roman 
geographers in classical antiquity, most famously in Claudius Ptolemy's second century geography. Details from Nicholas Germanus, 1467, copy of a map from Ptolemy's geography, showing the golden Chersonese, also known as the Malay Peninsula of Malaysia in the modern world. The horizontal line represents the equator, which is misplaced too far north due to its being calculated from the Tropic of Cancer using the Ptolemaic degree, which is only five-sixths of a true degree. Nanyang region, Nanyang, literally Southern Ocean, is the Chinese term for the warmer and fertile geographical region along the southern coastal region of China and beyond, otherwise known as the Southern Sea or Southeast Asia. The Chinese press regularly uses the term to refer to the region stretching from Yunnan province to Singapore, north to south, and from Myanmar, Burma, to Vietnam, west to east. In addition, the term also refers to Brunei, East Malaysia, East Timor, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and the region it encompasses. The alternative term, Great Golden Peninsula. Nanyang, the states to the south of China, around the South China Sea, are regarded as part of Nanyang. A general history of all voyages and travels throughout the old and new world from the first ages to this present time. Solomon trades by sea. That wise prince from whom no science could be hid was not ignorant of the art of navigation, for it is expressively mentioned in the ninth chapter of the first book of Kings that he fitted out a fleet at Ezon Geber. I cannot imagine on what grounds have fancied that Solomon had knowledge of the needle for sailing, which is very hard to be believed, since the fleet he sent to Ophir and Tarshish were three years out upon their voyage. Now whether these ships went into Africa, where then was the richest gold mine and all the world, or into India, towards the golden Chersonese and Malacca, since discovered by the Portuguese, or into China or Peru, whence the Spaniards have brought such immense treasures in these latter ages, golden Chersonese. Solomon fleets.
This is the method we may guess Solomon took to enrich his kingdom by trade with foreign nations far remote from Judea. It is likely that after he came to the knowledge of the wealth there was to be found in the other parts of the world, he sent out a fleet every year which did not return to three years after. This fleet set sail from the port afterwards called Bernice and which the scripture names Ezon Geber seated on the Red Sea. They sailed together as far as the Strait of Babel Mandel which is the mouth of the Red Sea where they parted the one half of the fleet coasted along eastward as far as India, Malacca, and other more distant parts. The other turned away towards Africa and returned home through the Mediterranean to the port of Joppa. Turned away towards Africa equals went around Africa. Encountering early America, Rachel Wincombe. One of the earliest theories relating to the origins of the peoples of the New World was first expounded by Christopher Columbus and later relayed to European readers by Peter Martyr. This theory claimed that America, particularly the island of Espanola, was in fact the land of great riches that the biblical King Solomon had purportedly sailed to, the land of Ophir. It is clear from Columbus' own writings that the story of Ophir heavily influenced his engagement with America. Columbus invoked the salient passages from the Old Testament books of Kings and Chronicles dealing with Solomon's voyage in a number of texts, including in his letter to Ferdinand and Isabella from his fourth voyage to the New World in 1503. In the letter, Columbus stated that, in his opinion, the mines that King Solomon had found in Ophir was identical to the mines that he had found in the New World. The Living Torah, a new translation based on traditional Jewish sources by Rabbi Aryeh Kaplan. Ophir, the place from which King Solomon brought gold. Authors identified Ophir with the New World. Archaeological interest of Pedra de Gavia. Wikipedia article. Pedra de Gavia is a mountain in Tujaca Forest, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Differential weathering on one side of the rock has created what is described as a stylized human face. And weathered markings 
on another face of the rock have been described as an inscription. Pedra de Gavia, Rio de Janeiro. The eyes of the face are looking towards the right hand of this picture. The etchings that can be seen on the dome of the mountain make up the supposed inscription. Interpretation of the Marks of Pedra de Givia by Bernardo de Azevedo da Silvia Ramos from his book Tratacos da America Prehistorica Esplamente do Brazil. The first row is the supposed inscription in Suto. The second row is a rough rendering of the Phoenician character. The third is a transliteration into Hebrew. The fourth is a rendering of the letters in the Latin alphabet. And the final line is the supposed message in Portuguese. It is reported that in Havia, near Rio de Janeiro, are letters several feet high inscribed upon a sheer cliff, face in cuneiform. The inscription reads, Bezer of the Phoenician Tyree, the first son of Jethbel. Jethbel ruled Tyree from 887 to 856 BC. In 1872, on the coast of Brazil, near Paribia, Joaquim Alves de Costa found on his property a stone that bore numerous characters, which no one understood. He copied them and sent them to the president of the Instituto Historico. A translation is as follows. We are Sidonians, Canaanites, from the city of the merchant king. We were cast up on this distant island, a land of mountains. We sacrificed a youth to the celestial gods and goddesses in the 19th year of our mighty king Hiram and embarked from Hazan Geber into the Red Sea. We voyaged with 10 ships and were at sea together for two years around Africa. Then we were separated by the hand of Baal and were no longer with our companions. So we had come here, 12 men and three women, and to Island of Iron. Am I the Admiral, a man who would flee? Island of Iron. Nay, may the celestial gods and goddesses favor us well. This eight-line inscription proved to be in Phoenician characters. There are reasons to believe that the king referred to was Hiram III, 553 to 533 BC. Brazil was known anciently as High Brazil. The incorporation of I or High is typically Phoenician. Brazil, Island of Iron.
Barzel, Hebrew for iron, Barzel, Brazil. Brazil, mythical island, Wikipedia, Brazil, also known as High Brazil, and several other variants, is a phantom island said to lie in the Atlantic Ocean, west of Ireland. Irish myths described it as cloaked in mist, except for one day every seven years, when it becomes visible, but still cannot be reached. Brazil, native name, High Brazil, High Brazil, High Brazil, High Brazil, High Brazil, High Brazil, I Brazil. Brazil, far left, as shown in relation to Ireland on a map by Abraham Ortelius, 1572. Location, mythical, Atlantic Ocean. Appearance on maps. Nautical charts identified an island called Brazil, west of Ireland, in the Atlantic Ocean, as far back as 1325, and a Portalan chart by Angelino Dursert. Later, it appeared as Insula de Brazil in the Venetian map of Andrea Bianco, 1436. Attached to one of the larger islands of a group of islands in the Atlantic. <laughs>